I'm here at MAGFest with artist Will Shanklin. Thank you for speaking with me. I'd like to start by asking, is there an artwork here you are most proud of and why? Um, there's a couple. Um, usually the ones that I'm really most proud of aren't the ones that sell the most because um, there'll be something in it that I knew was particularly technically difficult, but it doesn't really matter when it comes to content. But I guess the one that um, is the combination of the, of the two that I'm most proud of that sells the best would be the um, Vitruvian Man in front of the Large Hadron Collider sort of mix drawing that I did. Is that the uh, Aegis? Yeah, the, it's called the Golden Aegis. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's part of a story that I'm working on called 333. It's sort of like a sci-fi adventure that spans across multiple realities. And one of those is created by a uh, device that I call the Fibonacci Super Collider. And that's the, the uh, formal name for it is the Golden Aegis. Yeah, I saw that one. It looks really good. Thank you. Um, how do you know when a work is finished? Um, well, it's just, there, you can always keep going, but once you get to a point where the final layer of detail that you're going for is throughout the entire piece, you kind of just make yourself stop there. Otherwise, you'll just keep going and muddle it a bit, but you just kind of feel when it's done. So you feel you've been pretty uh, pretty good about doing that? Yeah, lately. It's like, um, it's, it's more of a, a challenge for me to simplify pieces of art than to make them more complex. So I've been aiming for simplicity lately. So what inspires you? Usually, if I read something in physics or philosophy that just pops an image into my head or I think, how can I merge these two ideas together into a captivating image, that's usually what does it. But mostly, I just have this ongoing story that I, when, when an idea comes to me that's like, Oh wow, that's really cool. That's really neat. I'll think, okay, now which characters and setting and idea from the story can I apply them to? And then just an image will just instantly come to me because I've been working on this story and I'm so familiar with the world and the, the characters that they're they're real to me that when something that I read inspires me, it just immediately creates an image without me really having to do anything at all. And I guess the piece uh, that we talked about, your favorite piece, it's inspired, you mentioned by the, the story, this ongoing story that you have. Yeah, definitely. Why did you pick that particular image? What about it? Well, um, well I first had the idea to draw the Large Hadron Collider because I saw that um, from directly down the center, it, it creates like a really captivating mandala. And I had been practicing making mandalas as like a meditation. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I were to create um, what would normally be like a, like a Buddhist mandala piece, but using the exact intricacies and layout of the Large Hadron Glider. And so embedded in that image is actually a uh, hidden geometric um, Buddhist mandala underneath of it in the first layer. Yeah, that, that piece is striking. I wonder if what you just mentioned is why that sort of subtle... It, it has to be. Whenever, there, whenever that, that geometry, like the sacred geometry underlies a piece, it just immediately uh, summons the awareness of the viewer. 
So what is your most important artist tool? Is there something special you can't live without in your studio? Um, not, not really. Um, the technique that I use has to do with, I call it the vibrational art technique. And basically what it, what it utilizes is the, the hand and the body's natural tendency to, to vibrate and to shake. So I discovered it while drawing with a really shaky hand. My hand was really shaky and I couldn't get a straight line, so I just decided to allow it. And what I, dis what I discovered is that shaking in the body and the hand, it's not just dumb jittering. It's not, it's not random in any way. It's, it's a fractal pattern. And when you let this, this pattern flow through you and when you allow it to go, you notice that maybe not on the first layer or on the second layer, but around the third layer, you start to see that there's an actual order to it. You'll see these fractals appear that eventually, as you layer and layer and layer this, leads to a very ordered geometry. And it, it led me to discover that when our anxiety isn't just isn't just this roadblock in a way, but it's a it's a it's more like a piece of music that you can channel. And when you channel that, you vibrate it through your hand, you can create these intricate patterns. And that's what I sort of I, I do. I, I let these I steer these patterns into drawing techniques to create familiar forms that mixed with abstract forms. Yeah, I was going to say that, that that idea that you just discussed you know, is pretty uh, mind-blowing, I guess, and uh, it makes total sense to me. It's really fascinating to hear you describe it that way. Yeah, once um, you see it, it makes sense. So how did you start making art, and why did you make art? Um, I've, I've been drawing since I was I just started doing it, and I guess I continued to do it because I just I found a way to channel anxiety into forms, and it's the thing that that uh, allows for silence and stillness to be okay. That's, that's sort of like what everybody's out here seeking for, whether it's through meditation, or working out, or consumerism, or anything you seek, uh, you know, uh, drugs, alcohol, all of it is just a way to allow yourself to be comfortable and feel okay in stillness, in silence, and this is, this is my method. Is there an element of art you enjoy working with most and why? I don't think I asked that already. Um, yeah, I I really, really enjoy attempting to bridge classical technique with modern illustration techniques. Um, I when my hand flows and is just doing the raw vibrational abstract stuff, I I enjoy finding ways to to, to pull those patterns into carefully executed, measured out, pers in perspective, in proportion type illustration work. And I, I, I really, really enjoy when the two of those are mixed. So I have like imagery or the narrative that's familiar forms, people, places, and things, but woven throughout that are the unmistakable raw vibration patterns. Liquid geometry. So it's interesting that I, I so you enjoy the sort of chaos of the vibration, but as you say there is some order to it. Yeah. So it's interesting that you can make sort of chaos and precision. Yeah, the and the key to it is as long as you're not trying to give it order. As soon as, you, as soon as you start to impose your will upon it, it, it looks forced. But if you just allow it, if you just like, I guess it's, 
it's a it's a form of, of faith because you just have faith that as you keep doing it, it's going to make what you set your intention for it to make. Like you, you don't have to try or force it. You just set your intention and let it go, let it vibrate, and it'll get there. So how did your first um, sale or professional art success, however you might define it, change the way you make art? Um, well, let's see. Yes. I, I, I think that the pieces that first started selling the most for me that gave me the clue that I could make money making art were the ones where I really was not trying to make anything that sold at all. It was just, I was just following a purely aesthetic path with the pen and just, just whatever felt and looked good to me in that immediate moment as I was making the strokes, those pieces ended up selling for us. So I realized that, um, uh, that that sort of, those pieces selling well sort of validated to me the idea that if I want, if I really want things, if I really want to uh, make a living at it, I have to just draw and make the things that that really feel good flowing out. Do you feel like that change increased your output, your pace of output, when you did, you know, being yourself? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I mean, I draw every day. Um, like, sometimes I go on just like multiple day long art vendors. And, um, but, you know, it goes up and down in waves, but, once it, once that that looseness started flowing out, it's been a pretty steady stream ever since. What role does the artist have in society? Well, so th this I've I've thought about quite a bit because I I used to think, well, what what use am I? Like, why when I think about a world like people and their usefulness, like, I'm getting money for something that has no use, but I, I, started re I started observing society and realizing something, that there's, there's, there's multiple parts to it that make it function, and so there are the very direct functions, like uh, people who provide food, people who provide water and shelter and, and uh, emergency care and things like that, doctors who heal people and keep people alive longer. All of that goes like a machine that runs day in and day out. It just runs, this machine. But we're not, as a species, we're not mechanical. We don't run mechanically. If we did, we would very quickly lose all motivation to get up in the morning and continue. So what I realized that the role of art is, is it's that thing that at the end of the day, the doctors, the lawyers, the, the police, the, the builders, the, the the farmers. At the end of the day, it's that thing that everyone goes home to and turns on the Netflix, picks up the book, looks at the art, picks up that thing that makes them, that makes it worth continuing this repetition each day. It's that, it's that third element that, that makes it worth it, that keeps it going. So, it makes me wonder you know, some people describe it as people watching films and cosplaying and stuff as escapism. But it sounds like you don't really, but you know, that has a negative right. connotation. Yeah, it does have a negative uh, connotation. And referring it to it as, as escapism is accurate, but that's only, it's only accurate in word choice, in, in, 
in uh, in observation in what you're seeing occurring. Like that's you know, that's just based on the words you choose to use for it because it is true. It is the point of a of temporarily escaping the monotony in order to continue pursuing the day to day. The the monotony. It's it's. It's part of it. It's one and the same. They're, they're a duality. It's there's there's no separation. I mean, you you go out, you hustle, you work, you then you recharge. You do something that turns that or that, that make otherwise you a lot of people have a hard time turning it off. Otherwise, if you don't have something that that gives you that off switch for a while, you never truly recharge. And then you then you perform poor in your skill set in your work. And you you never really grow because you, you have to rest. So would you consider your artwork work, or you know how how do you do you ever rest from your art? Do you need to? I do. Yeah. Well, my my artwork comes in, in two sets. There's my paid work, and then there's the the artwork that I work on when I want to rest from the paid work. So they. They both require energy, but one of them provides energy as well, simultaneously. Would you say there are any distinct differences, maybe themes or whatnot, between those two sets? Well, it comes down to like artwork that I internally decide I want to sit down and work on, and then artwork that I've been asked to do in exchange for money. So what movies, books, or other artwork in science fiction or fantasy have inspired you? Um, well, I guess technique-wise, artistically right now, I'm really, um, I've been really studying uh, the pen work of Bernie Wrightson and Franklin Booth. Um, as far as comics, I really love the cover art of the, the stark contrast and composition of Jay Lee. Um, I love uh, work from Mobius. Uh, that's that's sort of like something that inspired me to take the abstract work and form it into familiar objects and themes and story. Um, but other than that, I'm I'm inspired by a lot of nonfiction, physics, and philosophy. Uh, movies. I I like sci-fi, but. Mainly just, you know, the same stuff I've done watches on Netflix, uh, comedy a lot, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I can think of right now, actually. How about music, since you're interested in, you know, very detailed things? Uh, music, uh, it's funny, like, the music, uh, so I listen to, I listen to a lot of music without words. Mostly just stuff that keeps me in a good flow when I'm drawing. Um, a lot of like classical, electronic, some old uh, psychedelic rock. But the music that keeps me in the flow the hardest, like if I'm on a real art bender, is like hardcore booty bounce trap music, <laughs> which a lot of like most people have had have no idea yeah. that like. When I'm home alone, that's what I'm listening to. So looking at your art, I don't see it. You know, I don't see that it's been uh, affected or. or yeah, that won't, that won't that won't show through. That's <laughs> that's pure raw beats and rhythm that just keeps my hand just like bouncing, and jittering on the page. All right, it's pretty cool. Um, is there an art piece you'd like to create that you haven't done so yet, and what is it? Uh, well, the one I'm working on right now, actually, is another uh, collider piece. So it's going to be the eye of a collider. Way up high at the top of the cathedral is a stained glass window. And then the, the, uh, the, the coils and everything, and the, the, uh, the multiple decks of the facility, are going to be like the um, upper levels of the cathedral and the columns and the pillars and all the um, the ornate pieces, the pipe organ and all that. I'm going to create out of different pieces in CERN, which is the facility that houses the large bedroom collider. 
I also wanted to ask you, I saw you painted a piece, I think it was in Awesome Con a few months ago, a very red piece with sort of stark landscape, you can see it over there. Uh, you know, a lot of sharp spires. Oh, and, yeah. So, tell me about that piece. It seems, it seems tall, yet dangerous. Yeah, that one is called Cian Alexander. That's the character's name in it. Um, he's sort of like a, a wanderer in the, in the new landscape that's created in, in the story uh, after the world recycles. And those, those spires are sort of like just a mix of the fallen buildings of our time and the new sentient plants that have sort of grown around them and he's he was born in that landscape so he has like a symbiotic relationship with them was it was that one painted for someone for on commission or for yourself no just for myself all right so uh that's all the questions i have do you have any final thoughts or comments um well um i guess i could I can plug the book that I'm working on. It's called 333, and it's sort of like a psychedelic sci-fi adventure. Psychedelic as in it, mer it merges uh, like quantum physics and Eastern philosophy, a lot of uh, mental exploration mixed with the nature of reality and consciousness itself. Uh, it basically takes place around five scientists who trip a new universe into existence as the world is ending. Okay. Is, there a web, is there a website um, for your stuff? Uh, well, my, my website is willshanklin333.com. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for speaking. Thank you very much. Please visit chrisalvarez.com for more cool stuff. That's C-R-I-S-A-L-V-A-R-E-Z. Dot com. Thanks for listening and keep imagining the future.